All right, once again, good morning, everybody, and welcome to episode 166 of the On Air Advocate. Where at the On Air Advocate, we look to provide education, support, and empowerment for all of those with different abilities, mental and medical illnesses, and their caregivers. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Tammy Flynn, and I am the host and producer of the On Air Advocate, and I am super excited if you are joining us here early this morning, or whether you are catching this on the replay. Now, as always, if you think any of the content that we are talking about could be valuable for your network or your circle, please hit the share button and share the love with others. Well, as you guys know, we are entrenched in our hope series, which I just love, um, and I am so excited to have back once again one of my favorite, favorite, favorite people, Mary Tuttero. She is a wife, a mom, a caregiver, a speaker, a teacher, and an author. And she has just launched a new amazing book, The Peaceful Caregiver, which we're going to learn about. But first, welcome, Mary. Thank you. You just inspire me so much. You've got so much on your plate and you're up doing this at 7 a.m. <laughs> go girl. <laughs> Thank you. You're Thank you. Early as well. I think, I think all of us that are in that caregiving space, we have all different crazy hours. I know, I know there's lots of moms in the community that, you know, their time is like at two, 3 a.m. They sew, they knit, they got all, they, they do wonderful yeah. Or they text. Yes, um, all of that. And so for those that may have not caught you on another episode before, can you just give the folks that are tuning in a little bit about your background? Yeah. Um, my husband and I care for our daughter, Mary Addison. She's mentally and physically challenged. She's 27. So we've been caring for her for 27 years. Um, we also raised our son, William, who has graduated from college, not on his own pays his own bills. Thank you, Jesus. Um, and we also care for my mother-in-law through cancer and dementia. Um, and she passed away in 2016. So we were up to our eyeballs in taking care of other people. And everywhere I went, hospitals, doctor's offices, um, therapies, all that, I just saw other people who were really struggling like I was in the beginning with, right. this is totally ruining my marriage, my social life, our finances my career, everything. And um, I was just spiraling downward. And then God's word broke into my life through a miraculous set of circumstances. I had been a churchgoer, but I started reading about a God who stepped down, emptied himself, stepped down from glory to put a towel around his waist and wash feet and serve. And I realized that um, what the Bible was talking about was totally relatable, that instead of shaking my fist at God, he had a lot to teach me and that started his journey. And so I started writing it down and sharing it with the other people because I knew that there were just lots of other people like me. And it's just exploded into this, the heart of the caregiver ministry. I love it. I love it. If you have not watched our other segments, you definitely need to go back and catch those where we kind of went through the whole curriculum and the heart of the caregiver book because the heart of the caregiver is more of like a community as well, correct? I mean, from support groups to things based with inside of churches. Can you explain that just a little bit? Well, I, the heart of the caregiver, and this is the peaceful caregiver, which is the second right. book. There's actually physical curriculum and they're not my story. They're actually a Bible study through God's word of, uh, to offer you comfort and hope and inner healing. Um, and, but we've started small groups and then, you know, us caregivers have a hard time getting anywhere. Right. <laughs> you know, consistently, <laughs> yes. if something explodes. <laughs> and uh, so we started offering it online and doing online groups. And then we, then there were people who couldn't even make the online groups. So that we just had an online course. And then we started having Facebook discussions and it's just kind of grown into this whole thing. But my real prayer mm -hmm. is that the heart of the caregiver and the peaceful care, the curriculum will be a tool in the hands of the church to meet the needs of all kinds of caregivers um, that are attending in their communities, you know, and reaching out to their community to all kinds of people who have sick children in the hospital and just can't come to church, but they still need fellowship and connection with God's word. Right, right. And that is so powerful. And what I love is that um, with on your site, you have so many resources and it's not just like, you know, given a couple tips on this or that, but you really, really break it down and through, through the curriculum. And so I know your new book is The Peaceful Caregiver. 
and you're talking going from stress to blessed, <laughs> which I think we all we all need. And if you know, if anyone has followed me, um, though, you know, we don't always take a stance of doing religious or um, segments, so to say. I am a very, very religious person. I feel that you know all things are possible through God and His great work, and He has. Um, giving me this burden as a blessing, you know, this is a blessing upon me and I need to, you know, continue to grow within that and continue to ask for patience and grace through all the things that happen. Cause like you were talking about Mary and we've talked about before, there's such a, a, a mourning process around it. It's, it, 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 there's just so many layers of it, you know, from our own personal impact by it, but to then watching our children, our young adults, our elderly parents, go through, you know, traumatic situations and them um, not having the healing that we want them to have, you right. know? So there's all that feeling. And so with the peaceful caregiver, um, I, how does that kind of walk through? I know that I went on and got this awesome kind of five step, the, the path to peace. I need some peace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the heart of the caregiver was all about shifting your perspective and really being able to see that this wasn't something horrible that had been done to us, that this was an opportunity for us to shed old thoughts and expectations and grow and learn that there's a whole nother way to live and love. Yes. And um, if you let this very difficult set of circumstances open you to that, um, it can really transform your life. Mm -hmm. and all of your other relationships. So that was really the first book. Right. But what I saw in my groups, we've been teaching this for 10 years, but what I saw in my groups was um, it's so hard to live that out on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's then the, the peaceful caregiver starts with what steals your peace. And it's everything from my next door neighbor who will clean up the poop and the UPS driver step, walks it up my front step <laughs> to I hate, spiders to um you know my the the family members that don't want to help you right. um that uh the schools are not cooperating i mean there's just a thousand things that steal your peace you know that you can't lose weight <laughs> and we live in this state of um like negativity yeah and almost like we live in a world also that trains us and th these are all chapters in the book about being a victim and seeing yourself as just being a victim of this world gone nuts so people are ranting at the tv screen and they're ranting at the radio and they're ranting at facebook and and we just live in this world of, and right. and it's killing us mm -hmm. and there is a way to have peace regardless of your circumstances right. and the choice and so the peaceful caregiver uh, really helps you understand and make you aware of why all this insanity, you know, when people always want to go, well, so you just think we live in a fallen world? Well, yeah, we live in a world that's built on ego and all that. But you don't have to listen to those voices. You can live another way and it's living from peace. And until you get there, especially when you're dealing with other people's suffering that you can't control mm -hmm. and you're dealing with systems and institutions that you can't control, but they seem to have control over you, right. schools and hospitals and Medicaid and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can still have peace. And so in the book, we offer kind of a step-by-step -step of how to calm your thoughts and listen for a new option instead of letting your old thoughts jerk you around. That's the nutshell. <laughs> well, and I think that that's so important and um, you, you spoke and touched on all of that so well is that on a daily basis, there's so much negativity, you know, and, and sometimes we just need to tune out the noise, you know, and try to focus in on the things that, that are, you know, that are good, you know, every morning when the sun rises, you know, when you, when you are up, when, you know, every night when I'm driving, I'm driving my thousand miles, I told you, you know, I'm looking at the clouds and how they're formed and the sunset and the sunrise and all of that. And to appreciate those small things, 
um, that are there instead of listening. And, and I completely agree with you as social media is awesome because it lets us connect right here. Yeah. Like what's going on? It's just like, and, and now that I know that the political stuff's coming up again, I don't even, I don't even know that I look like I kind of, you know, do what I need to do because right. we really need to feed ourselves on a daily basis with the negative thoughts. Right. But I think there's, there's real reasons why we don't take the time to be, I guess a Buddhist word is mindful. Mm -hmm. um, a Christian word is contemplative or centering or prayer. Um, but it's not really pertaining to any one religion. It's a practice that can totally change your life. And that's being aware of the things that are jerking you around and realizing they're jerking you around and you have a choice, you know, and they're old stories, negative emotions, things that you've been taught from your parents, from your schooling, you know, stuff that aren't necessarily true. They're just the way the people around you have handled things, but you don't have to handle them that way, you know. Well, we've always gotten irate at the Democrats or Republicans or what. Right. Okay. Well, you don't have to. Um, the other enemy that we have of this is um, a lot of people think that being mindful, contemplative, centered um, is um, chanting, going blank, you know, allowing weird spirits in. And that's not it at all, because you can't stop thinking. We all think. That's what our minds were meant to do. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of these steps is learning how to allow your thoughts and then to pause and not let the drama of the thought drag you down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance is you hear a thud in the other room and the caregiver supposedly in there with your daughter and you hear the thud and you go, okay, I've got to jump up and go in there because something terrible has happened. That caregiver isn't doing her job at all. I don't know why we haven't fired her. I mean, how could she let my daughter roll out of bed? I'm sure that's what's happened. My daughter's rolled out of bed and she does it all the time. But you know what? That's my fault. I should have bought a gate for the bed. And okay. So you see how you quickly, this all, all you heard was a thud. And suddenly all this drama starts, right? Right. And, and it makes you nuts. And then you go in the room to find out that it was just a book fell off a shelf or right. it was really your husband down in the kitchen pulling out something. And, but we let the drama of what we think about it get in our heads and ruin our day. It's the same thing with like angry drivers. You know, you get furious with an angry driver and I should have cut him off and I'm not going to let him back into traffic and who does he think he is when really it might be somebody racing to the bedside of a dying loved one right you don't know right. so why let it ruin your day you know so we have thoughts but it's just how do you control not having the drama around the thoughts so that you can observe and understand clearly what's actually happening and how to make good decisions not based out of fear yeah. and pain. Yep, those emotional decisions. Now, on your site, which we're gonna give everybody the link to, you have within the book, The Peaceful Caregiver, kind of a printout on your, your site of your five steps, your, your path to peace. And so, where did these five steps come from? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know, <laughs> but I, I love it. Or, um, so in this path is, there is a, a place to start. You feel that helps you to kind of work through as you're, as you're going through it. Yeah. And I'm not looking at it, but I'm pretty sure oh, wow. it's the first one awareness. Uh, I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> it's awareness. And, um, you know, these, these steps are not, um, I mean, I think plenty of people have heard them from all kinds of different places, but these particular five are the ones that really gave me aha moments, you know, super aha moments. So awareness was really just the, when I became aware that I had a choice, that I didn't have to be angry and worried and um, 
defeated and last and wrong. I mean, because with a child that has seizures that are not under control, which is our daughter for 27 years, I started thinking of myself as a mom who was a failure. And because I'd had to tell so many of my friends, no, I can't do this. No, I can't do that. I, I have to drop out of this. I, you know, and because so many caregivers never showed up, you know, and so I was always calling people and canceling things and events and all that. I just began to feel like I was such a failure. Right. And if I wasn't blaming myself, I was blaming somebody else. So I just was living angry and defeated all the time. And then I'm taking care of somebody who's medically fragile, making terrible decisions because I'm making them out of fear and worrying what other people think and no confidence because I thought of myself as a failure. Ew, it was just a mess. It was just a mess. Mm -hmm. And the day it dawned on me that I had a choice that I didn't have to live from that place of failure, fear, worry, that it was a choice and I, there was a different choice. And for me in the Christian faith, it was listening to the Holy Spirit, that there's another voice. There's the voice of the universe. There's the voice of source. There's the voice of love that can guide me instead of insanity and fear. And I got crazy curious about how in the world do I do that? How do I, I'm aware that I have a choice. Now what? You know? Right. And I love that on here. So on this printout, there's also some scripture on here, um, but it's just great. I, I love it. I love how you give such good, useful material um, that you can, and the great for hanging up on your fridge too, just to remind you. Um, the next one is, this is what I need to practice. I don't know that I'm ever. <laughs> and that's probably the hardest of all, you know, is that stillness because if you sit down in a chair, just like what I took the scenario with the caregiver, you hear a thud in the other room. If you try and sit still, it's going to make you nuts. You put it, you put it, you put the timer on your phone and just try sitting there for two minutes in stillness. And you're not, you, you're just going to hear that voice going, why am I doing this? This is a waste of time. I've got things to do. I'm not hearing anything anyway. Well, of course not, because you're hearing your own thoughts and they're nuts. <laughs> and so, you know, how do you really experience quality stillness? And that's learning to recognize that you're having these thoughts, but then just letting them go on by um, and just like watch them float on by. Don't attract any, um, emotion to them and just sit there in stillness and at first it seems totally ridiculous and there's reasons for that and and that is because we feel like if we sit there we're missing out on everything that's going on right there's competition and if i don't know and if i'm not learning and if i'm not listening to all the voices of this world somehow i'm going to get run over by this world like a freight train so being still feels stupid because of all the competition and everything. You feel like you've got to be in the know. The other reason why being still is a problem is because um, it feels unsafe. If I'm not constantly what ifing, what if this medication makes her sick? What if the chemo doesn't work? You know, what if we don't get the funding we need for that therapy? You know, that if I'm not constantly listening to medical chatter, reading books, all that kind of stuff, that somehow I might miss something and it's good. I'm going to be wrong or I'm going to make an unsafe decision. I mean, don't you, don't you feel that way so often? I would say when we talk about stillness for, for caregivers, you know, I feel like we, we always have to be on, you know, I mean, as you know, countless evenings and, you know, nights, overnights in the hospital, alarms going off for those that are on different monitors at home. I mean, and we've talked about this before that, you know, when we're, when we're a caregiver, but a lifelong caregiver, you know, um, not for our, our elderly loved ones, that's that short kind of stint of time between maybe a year to nine years, you know, when you're talking 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it's like, I always say for, um, my unstillness, I'm like, I've been trained for the last 23 years. Get up, be alert, 
you know, um, all hours of the night and you're, you're going. And so I think that um, stillness is hard for many. Because you can still be doing that because I do too. And we get up all the time and it's like when the bomb goes off, you know, of a seizure and all that. I mean, you can't just sit there and go, oh, look, she's bleeding from her left eye. <laughs> no, you, you can't just sit there. Right. But the stillness I'm talking about is a mental stillness. Right. That you don't panic. You don't launch into all the drama and the self-pity and here we go again. I can't believe it. Oh my God. Or, oh, you know, that you are able to observe what's happening, do what needs to be done next but without the emotional drain and pain. Um, that makes you go into the emergency room ready to rip heads off or into an IEP meeting as the angry mom that you're able to still function, yeah. highly function and function better from this place of no drama. Right. No ego. Just I'm looking at what is actually happening mm -hmm. and I'm dealing with it. And for me, you know, the next step is very spiritual because why I'm being still is to listen for a voice that knows an answer I don't even know, a better answer, a better way, um, a higher way. And that's where my decisions started coming from wisdom, mm -hmm. which I was not capable versus from my pain. I started making decisions for my daughter from wisdom, from a voice that knew what she needed more than I did. And that knew what I needed more than I did. And that knew what everyone needed for clarity and for results that I could never get to happen from my own anger and pain. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was actually miraculous when I started being aware that I had a choice quieting the hysteria and anger and fear and listening for a new wisdom. And it was there <laughs> and it's changed my marriage. It's changed our finances. It's changed Mary's outcomes. Right. It changed how we raised our son. It changes everything. Right. Including that I haven't died of a stroke or a heart attack yet. <laughs> and this is this is uh, National Heart Month. So, and if you haven't done the studies on that, do you know it's the leading cause of death amongst every everyone? You know, it's the number one killer, number one killer in women. And it isn't just because you eat the fat on your steak. It's the stress. It's living in this constant state of. <gasps> Mm -hmm. And I find that when I work um, with families on advocacy is that, you know, I, as you're saying, kind of removing that drama and that emotion for us to ever have clarity and make really, you know, good decisions. We do have to calm that because or else all the things we're thinking are kind of fogging our view of, okay, so what actually needs to be done? Do we look at the risk factors? Have we researched the hospitals? You know, you don't slow it down enough to this. You're just hysterical over here because of this. And once you do that and you can remove that emotion, and I sometimes even advise when it comes to more of that medical end for my families, I'm like, if you're there and they're giving you news that might be highly emotional, you know that you're not going to make a good decision for the next appointment, for what the next step is, leave. Tell yeah, them, leave. I need to regroup. And I'm going to call tomorrow, you know, or the next day, make whatever appointments I need, but right now, and I'll come back. And if you don't have your list of questions, I'll come back with that and go and that there's nothing wrong with that. You no, know, but the, that seems, that seems wrong. That seems ridiculous. I mean, and I've been teaching these classes long enough that people go, I couldn't do that. Right. Well, well what you're doing right now isn't working. <laughs> you know, you just have a whole lot of people fighting with you and you're mad at everyone. And, and so, you know, another big enemy of, of this whole process, Tammy, is this is hard, is emptying. 
yourself mm -hmm. and letting go of old stories, old emotions that really don't have anything to do with the moment. I realized that so much of my anxiety and pain towards my daughter, I had never been really an angry person, like hysterically angry. And my daughter was bringing out rage in me. Like I hit her. She walked around Disney world with a big slap mark on the back of her leg where I had hit her, you know? And I thought you, I'm turning into a crazy woman, this sweet little girl who can't help how she is. She doesn't have bad behaviors or anything. It's just her life is very difficult and caring for her is very difficult. And it brought out this rage in me. And I realized that it was because my life caring for her wasn't living up to all the expectations I've been taught from my parents of what it meant to have a good and meaningful life, you know, that you, you have to have a good job and you have to have a good social network. And, you know, and here I am living in isolation, having quitting my work and half of our income is gone. All of our savings is gone. And all I can do is look at her and be furious at her. Right what kind of way is that to be a caregiver for someone? Mm -hmm. You know, and I had to realize that I had to let go of all those old expectations and all those old stories. Um, I don't know if we have enough time, but I'm going to do this really fast. Have you ever heard the story about cutting off the end of the ham? No. Well, so this is the young mother who says, I want to host Thanksgiving this year. Mom, teach me how to make our wonderful ham that we've been serving for generations. And she goes, okay, well, you get out your pan and you get a nice piece of ham and you cut the end off and you put it in the pan. The daughter goes, wait a second, wait a second. Why do we cut the end off? And the mom goes, I don't know. Let me ask my mom. So, okay. The young woman's grandmother and the young woman's grandmother says, I don't know why we cut the end of the ham, ham off. Let me ask my mother, her, so the young woman's great grandmother. And she says, well, I always cut the end of the pan, ham off because I had a small pan. <laughs> Okay, so here's this young woman that's been taught from generation to generation that the way to make this great ham is by cutting off the end of it is the first thing you do and throwing away perfectly good ham. It was only because her great great grandmother had a small pan. But we do that in families. We teach this is how we do things, even though there's no truth to it. Right. This is our tradition. This is why we do it. I did a segment around the holidays on that about traditions that are with us traditions can be changed at any time but it, it's us embracing that and being okay with it you know we, you can make a new tradition today yeah you know um today later on my grandson is sleeping overnight and i went and i bought all heart pans for valentine's day and so yeah. i have like, <laughs> like 15 different pans jello jigglers and i think i might make it a tradition that every valentine's day if it goes well in our cooking Right. Do that. But, you know, I try to instill in people that a tradition can, you can develop one, a new one, every single day. You well, know? a tradition is just like an emotion that we've been taught. We are Democrats or <laughs> we are, are loud and angry Italians or Tutteros, whatever we are. Or, you know, we just don't like going to Florida. Well, maybe it was because your great great grandmother went to Florida and something happened. I don't know, but we we form opinions and we form emotional attachments to old stories that aren't necessarily even true. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. So you have a choice. You don't have to believe that anymore. Just like you have a choice of going, this tradition isn't working for us. It's the same thing with emotions. And so emptying is another step that is very, very difficult. But think of all the things that drive your painful thoughts and ask yourself, is it true? Mm -hmm. Is and it I, really true? I wanted to just like commend you on your transparency because like what you said with your daughter and when you were at Disney World and you know what I'm saying? You were just in, infuriated at things i think that so many of us lifelong caregivers we get to a point where we snap and well however that is whether it's yelling whether it's just being unproductive with the negativity coming out of our mouth whether it's doing something but a lot of times do we are we really going to say that now here we're caring 
for, you know what I'm saying, our loved one that has all these complications, that doesn't have the best quality of life, that doesn't have things, how can you be mad? So then, you know, you're upset, you're emotional, you feel lost, you feel mourning, but then you're mad at yourself because you shouldn't feel that, you know what I'm saying, way, because they're the ones that are suffering. It's a lot in the space of, right, you know, to be transparent, to be like, yeah, I do get that angry. Yeah. I mean, I, I have just days where, you know, my son is like, are you all right? You know, he is verbal. <laughs> I am like, you know, you well, repeatedly do the same thing over yeah. and over and over again and they, seeking a different result. But we know within the space of different abilities that that's what you'll do a lot, right? You'll yeah. repeat the same steps over and over again, you know, hoping for a different result, hoping that they may gain that skill, hoping that they'll do that. And it might be never come or it might take nine years. And at yeah. some point, you kind of snap a little bit. Like, didn't we just do this? Because that is, that is the definition of insanity, isn't it? <laughs> That's it. That's <laughs> it. And expect and, a result. And the other thing about, about this um, insanity is that it affects, it doesn't just affect how we treat our person with special needs, even though we do, or, or whatever the exceptional need is, whether it's behaviors or mental illness or whatever it is. But when you realize this and you do this inner healing, you begin to see that other people's pain is a call for love. It's not a call for you to spew more of your pain because you can't deal with their pain. And when you realize that if I do the inner healing and I can greet someone else's pain and suffering with acceptance, allowing, stillness, waiting for a larger voice to speak, I'm actually creating room for peace in the world and in all my relationships. Instead of myself, and this is a whole other chapter in the book and I'm kind of skipping you know, the five steps. I mean, we'll get back to the, the last steps, but you become a peacemaker because you are helping other people see that there's a different way to manage all the nutso stuff in the world. I have to say if that's the one piece of real fruit that God has brought forth from our family's suffering is other people ask all the time, I want what you have. I want that level of peace. I want to be able to have good stuff come out of this, not just have it completely ruin my life, my marriage, my friendships, my other children. I want that. And it's real and it's palpable and anybody can have it. It just takes work to deal with your own junk. Right. and. Like you said, dealing with your own junk, reflection, all of that. And also, does listening come, it, part of that is that reflection is listening, right? Right. And like I said, you know, it's when you can quiet yourself and listen for, listen for a different answer. Listen from a heart of love and, and peace instead of a heart of fear and anger, um, because you'll hear a different message. And the other thing is, can you imagine, well, yeah, I can. It's happened to me. But being cared for by someone who's clipping your fingernails, wiping your bottom, bathing you, feeding you, but you're being cared for by someone who will not listen to you, no matter how difficult it is for you to communicate, and no matter how much, whether it's a person with Alzheimer's or like my daughter who has a very difficult time making her needs clear to strangers, you know. But the gift of being able to listen, to really listen to someone else, again, is, is so valuable in the world of creating peace. If we would just stop listening to our own ego, our own drama, our old, old stories, our old expectations, and start really listening to the people that we're talking to, well, that alone could do miracles for the whole world you know because you know compassion starts with listening you can't be a compassionate caregiver if you haven't listened to the people that you're caring for you know and listening to someone is a great sign of respect so whether it's your mother with Alzheimer's or your child with autism 
it changes the relationship when you will just take the time and be humble enough and slow down enough to just listen and let them know that you're listening. You know, that's, that's so important. And, and when you start doing that, it, it creates tremendous space for reconciliation. And it's like I told you, you know, I listen for this voice. You know, I listen for higher guidance. That has helped me reconcile with God. Um, I was so angry with God for so long. But once I started getting still and listening for his voice and realizing that the new things I was hearing were actually making my life so much better, that he really did love me and want things to change, that was incredible. But once I started listening to my daughter, really listening to what she was drawing, what she was singing, what she was crying about, what she was saying. It totally changed our relationship and allowed me to care for her better. Because instead of my just going, well, I know what you need and I'm your mother and by God, this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing it. Because we're in a hurry and you're too slow and I can't deal with this. Oh my gosh, can you see what a shift that is? When, when I would say to people, wait a minute, Let's hear what she has to say. And I remember my doctor thinking, that is so ridiculous. She can't be a part of this decision. And I'm going, yes, she can. She has to be. How can I make a decision for someone else? I, I owe her the respect. Of, we're talking around her. Nobody's talking to her about cutting out half of her brain or putting her on a dangerous medicine. Who am I to make that decision? all by myself without a higher guidance and without her allowing her to participate in any way she can in that, that that's, that's a game changer. It seems ridiculous, but it's, it's very important. And I think that, um, that is a hard, um, what word am I searching for? It's a hard place to get to as a caregiver, especially if you've been caring for someone their whole life and you've done it that way. Like you're saying, you know, you're making the decision. And I have found that now that my son is an adult and we're in rooms. And like I told you next week, we're going to our state capital. And, you know, we, we just sat at a conference and you know what I said to him? Because sometimes as a parent, I can't always leave the room. You know, I'm, I've just, I'm so entrenched in all of his medical and all of this and advocating for him and whatnot. As I said, do you want me to sit in this meeting? Because there was a, there's a, like a forum meeting. And it was just the, t you know, the teenagers, some parents sat in there. And I just said, I already know what we're doing. I know what my role is. Do you want me to stay in here? Or do you want to be, you know what I'm saying? So, and he's like, oh, out. <laughs> and so I did. And so now I've started whenever we're somewhere and I know that, you know, he has someone, you know, leading it's, it's his own thing. You know, he's the one that's going to have to speak. He's the one that's going to work with the conductor. Right. I, I need to be there. But as a special needs mom since birth, you know, we've done everything. So that is something that takes a lot of work. And I have found you've, you've come probably many more circles than I at this point, but I'm just starting to come to say, you know what, I might not be able to sit there and not interject. So if I feel that he's in a safe environment, I'm going to say, you're going, you know, I, now when he works with one of his there, I, I leave, I go sit out in my car. I go walk outside, to give him ind independence and him space and he can use his voice. And so I feel like that's my baby step. <laughs> I'm working on it. Yeah, and read this chapter because you, you will be so blessed by the love. Because now you're operating as a mom and a caregiver from a place of trust and love instead of control and fear. Right, right. That, that allows for supernatural things to happen. Miracles. Mm -hmm. And that allows for something that you could never have imagined. And I know with every fiber within us, we feel like, yeah, but it's also waiting for something really dangerous to happen. Right. Right. And that's okay. You know, so it does come from a place of fear. Or, right. Are they going to understand? Are they going to take care of him? Is he going to be okay? 
you know, but I've just started this. This is a very new adventure in this space. I've just started, even when he goes to visit family, I'm like, do you want, do you want me to stay here? Do you want to hang out with grandma by yourself? Do you want to do this? You know, he's like, no, I, I want to eat with grandma because you know, he does want to have that, but you know, especially when you have chronically ill, medically ill areas of fragileness, all of these things where, you know, bad things can happen. If he eats the wrong food, somebody doesn't do it the right way. If you've lived your life that way in this hysteria, it is really hard. Very hard. To walk away. So that's my new thing. It, ju it just started. It just started like this last. Little baby steps. We've been doing this for not quite 27 years. So I didn't even wake up to the reality that I had a choice until she was about 13. So, you know. <laughs> I kept going, well, this is another human being. Who am I to just be completely running this person's life? And it's killing me. You know? I'm in that case. Nobody <laughs> likes me anymore. I'm that mom. And you know what? Oh, in, no. in our world, in our space, though, isn't it interesting how we are all like, we're almost proud of it. You know, like we're that mom. We're that mom at school. We're that mom at the doctor's office. Mm-hmm. We're that dead mom. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because, you know, I mean, and because the longer it goes on, you know, you're in this for the long run and you will, you'll make yourself kind well, of. You first you'll be lonely. You'll lose all your friends. <laughs> you'll be angry, you know, and um, I, there's just no way to live and, and caring for someone, loving and caring for someone who has exceptional needs is not meant to be the death of us. It's meant to be the death of old ways of doing things right. for better ways, but it's not meant to ruin us. It's meant to give us a better life. It's the, it's the very life of, of, of our servant, Jesus. It's, it's, it's a calling to love and serve others. It's why we're here. It's our job. It's not meant to kill us and be some, freaky exceptional thing we do that's what we're here to do is take care of each other right okay so all the moms and dads out there <laughs> your little step could just be walking out of the room for 10 minutes <laughs> well and there's just such wisdom in that whole just stop and count to 10 mm -hmm. let's just put it that simply listen right. for a new thought that's okay Yes. And then, you know, for your five steps, you know, it's that listening. And then the last step is, is prayer. And I, you know, I, some people are like, well, don't, some people need, like, they feel like they need a space to pray. You know, um, I, I don't know. I pray every day, all the time in the car, but you know, I also believe in, you could maybe lend to help me with this. You know, I'm a firm believer that we can pray for things, but if we're not willing to move our feet, if we're not willing to do the work as well, you know, um, God will be there, but we also need to actively be moving forward. You know, we need, we yeah, can't, but not an in insanity, mm -hmm. not an anger. Not in fear. In I mean, and that's, that's the whole thing. I learned this whole new way of praying that isn't coming before God, shaking my fist or coming before God with, um, or source or universe, whatever you want to call it, um, with a list of problems and what are you going to do about it? And here's what I think you should do about it. You know, all that. Um, and to your point about praying, um, there's a way to just be present to what's happening, mm -hmm. to allow this whole, I mean, I, and I know probably most of your listeners are not going to be sitting in front of their book, but on page 50, there's an actual step-by-step -step of a way to pray that it's actually changed my life is that you, you're aware of your situation and what you're feeling. You quiet your thoughts and feelings about the situation and invite divine source god to minister to you knowing i'm the only one that can change <laughs> mm -hmm. you know i'm the only one it's how i feel about this that's making me nuts and so i'm you've got to minister to me let go of expectations you know these are these steps you know just let go of what is it that i think has to happen 
And then just give gratitude for the fact that, and in my faith, that God is working all things together for good. That somehow it's all going to work out if what I bring to the situation is peace and love, not anger and fear and hate and worry. So it's really, it's a kind of prayer where it's help me to let go of all that mess and bring peace into the situation because far more can good can come of this if I'm here in the middle of this mess in a state of receiving and then being able to give love instead of doling out more pain. Yes. Does that make any sense? Yes, it definitely does. And I find, you know, I find myself a lot of times in the space where, especially in this journey, as you know, you know, my young adult now was in school and was in the school full time. And, you know, so now these milestone transitions have changed and how is your career changing and what are you going to do and what is this going to look like? And, you know, we have all these pressures, all those stresses you know, that we're talking about your finances and all of that and putting it more in God's hand and being like, if this is the right spot, you know, for me to be, you know, sitting in that silence and and listening. Um, And I have to say that I feel that um, he, I have listened and um, he's always heard, you know, and I, and I, Some people are like, you know, what's your business plan? What are these plans? What are those plans? And I'm always like, well, it's God's plan. Um, I need to keep getting up and I need to keep doing these things and I need to keep growing as a person and I need to keep realizing that, um, like you were saying, having that awareness, um, looking to better myself and a better way to um, receive things. And by that, I know that he will answer where I'm supposed to be. And he can use you. You know, because the other way of praying and the other way of being is treating God like your fairy godfather and going, I need this to happen, Lord, Mm -hmm. and you haven't made it happen yet, and I really don't think I believe in you because you hadn't made that happen, okay? Well, if he does what you're asking, who's running the universe? You or God, right? So the only way to have a peaceful relationship because the book goes on about reconciliation with God, reconciliation with yourself, believe it or not, and reconciliation with others in peace. Because if you haven't come to a place of peace with God and, and, and the divine intelligence that runs the universe, it isn't about bowing to an angry God. It's about you're going to die and this is all going to keep going on without you. You're not running the universe. So if that's true, why not let what is running the universe guide you in love and peace? Why should your anger and fear run things? We Yikes. Have, <laughs> we have a lot to take in today. <laughs> it's only 7.57 in the morning. <laughs> But I, you know, I love all this and it, you know, it all comes down to like within the book and whatnot, you know, reflection. I mean, you have to take those moments. We continue to run and we continue to do things the same way we've always done. If we continue to stay in that world of insanity, repeatedly doing this, you know, repeatedly doing the same thing, hoping for a different result. And we don't do mindful things along these lines to change. It, it's never going to change. And, and that's so true for the entire world. And we're all bitching and complaining, pardon my French, <laughs> about what um, is going on in the world. But we're participating fully in it as long as we continue to function in our own anger and our own fear. Mm-hmm. Because every day when we get up still feeling that way and not doing the work to come to a place of peace before I contribute, I'm contributing to the insanity of what's going on in our world today. Yes. So, Mary. If folks want to get the book, which do you have the cover of the book that you can? Oh yeah. Oh, look at that. Peaceful caregiver. Um, Go to the peacefulcaregiver.com and that's just the book and the download that you have. Or you can go to the heart of the caregiver.com, which is kind of like the whole program. It's where the videos and you can sign up for a newsletter 
it'll you can get to the peaceful caregiver and get the downloads um, there's all kinds of stuff on both of them but if I if I could say anything is get connected with other people and get reconnected with um, divine source and do the work to get the peace it is so worth it it changes it really does change everything yeah so whether it is the heart of the caregiver you guys have you have facebook groups within there right right and we're the heart of the caregiver because there are other organizations trying to use heart of a caregiver heart of the caregiver without the the but we're the the okay um, to get to that, but on the website, you can access all of those things, right? You know, I think that it is so important. One thing that I have learned, like Mary was saying, is that you have to join a positive support system, you know, that are out there where you can share your trials and tribulations, but also your triumphs and that there is positive energy and feedback that's coming to you because this space is you know, it's, it's for the long run. It's, you know, it's for the duration. And so you won't make it, it will become a little baddie. Well, and that's, I, oh, we could talk forever, but I, I, I'm a friend and an enemy of Facebook, just like you said at the very beginning, because there are so many Facebook groups where all they do is get together, announce their pain, and then everybody else confirms the pain and wallows in the pain with them. Mm -hmm. I call that empathy, which is great. You jump down in the hole with somebody and wallow in their pain with them. But compassion is you get down in the hole with them with the ladder so both of you can get out of that hole. Right. Not just wallow in other people's pain, which is what so many of these Facebook groups do. Oh, I feel so much better because somebody else's pain is worse than mine. That won't get you anywhere. Right. And I have heard that over and over again from this show from other parents like, oh, I've exited so many groups. I used to belong to these groups and all it was was negativity. I can, I can tell you that, um, you know, we're looking for not only sharing, but the things that help us grow, you yeah. know, usual things like, you know, hey, this happened. What about offering a resource? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry that that happened. Um, can you maybe hook onto this link? And it might help you find that doctor or that thing that you need. You know, we're supposed to be looking at, you know, problem solving, yeah. you know, and not just helping to wallow, you know, in it, because that just keeps us down in, in the hole. So if you guys go over to the website, which we will drop in the top contents of this, but Mary, you can also drop it below. Um, the Heart of the Caregiver website, you guys can download your own The Path to Peace. Yes, and then you can sign up for the newsletter. We do workshops, retreats, webinars, peace retreats, um, all kinds of stuff um, through our newsletter, and you'll get announcements and when classes and online small groups and all that kind of stuff is starting, so you can really start getting connected to positive stuff. Wonderful, and congratulations again on your new book, The Thanks. Peaceful Caregiver, and I just love that. I wish that, I need a shirt that says that. Could you make a shirt that says that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. And then you have like oh, some mom with some crazy hair <laughs> and then you're blessed. Yeah. I think it needs to be a shirt. I love that. I love that tagline. Um, wonderful and truly a way that we should live. So let's this whole week, let's practice the things that Mary said, try to de-stress, find our blessings. We're all here this morning. Um, so that's a blessing just within itself. So thank you so much, Mary, for sharing yeah. all your golden nuggets. You're just, you're amazing. Um, every time that you're on, you know, I just, it helps me to process, you know, so many things as well. So you are just such a blessing to so many and I just appreciate you. I'm grateful. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so with that, if you guys want to know any more about the services that the on-air advocate offers, you can head over to onairadvocate.com and you'll find all of our resources there. Or if you would like to join our private Facebook group, you can head up to the top of this uh, Facebook page, hit the blue button, and that will let you into our private group. So with that, Mary, enjoy your warm 70 degree weather in South Carolina. <laughs> yep. All the sun beaming in my window. I'm feeling it's good. And instead of saying we're having another snowstorm tonight in Wisconsin, I'm going to say next week it's going to be in the 40s. Yes, that's warm for us. Positivity, guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Bye-bye.